Good afternoon. I'm Professor Roger Francis, Chairman of the Padgett Association, the only charity in the UK dedicated to Padgett's disease of bone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the James Padgett University Hospital in Great Yarmouth, which is being broadcast throughout the internet to people elsewhere in the UK, Canada, Australia and beyond. We are holding th this Paget's Awareness Day today as it is exactly 205 years ago since Sir James Paget was born here in Great Yarmouth. I hope that this meeting will provide helpful information about Paget's disease of bone, the work of the Paget's Association, and also the life of James, Sir James Paget. At the conclusion of the meeting, we also plan to hold um, a question and answer session where the speakers will address questions from the audience here in Great Yarmouth together with those submitted by text or email. The first speaker this afternoon is Mr Hugh Sturzaker, MBE, who worked as a consultant surgeon here in Great Yarmouth. He has also written two books, one about the James Paget University Hospital, the other a biography of Sir James Paget. He is therefore ideally placed to speak about the life of Sir James. So I'd like to welcome Hugh to the podium. Well, thank you very much. Uh, to, to cover the whole of uh, Sir James Paget's life in 10 minutes is a bit of a challenge, but I'll do my best. He was born in Great Yarmouth, and this is a contemporary uh, drawing of Great Yarmouth with the town hall and a very busy river uh, about the time of his birth. And he was born at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 205 years ago, so a happy birthday to James, uh, in that house. Um, there. Uh, and that had been built by his father uh, the year before. His father was um, a very successful businessman uh, and ship owner. Uh, he owned a brewery and uh, 40 pubs in the area, uh, and he also was a partner in a bank, which, which eventually became Barclays. Uh, his mother uh, was much better educated, um, and she was a very good collector, and Sir James picked up a lot of hints about orderly arrangement of uh, collections from her. Just behind the no entry sign is the school he went to on South Quay, and there's a door there leading into it. Um, he wasn't very impressed with the uh, school teacher, who was a retired actor, uh, but he did learn uh, French, Latin, uh, and some Greek. He ended up being head boy. He then, at the age of 16, became apprenticed to the local uh, doctor um, and learned about bandaging and uh, dealing with bleeding and also bleeding people to make them feel better and draining abscesses. Um, while he was doing this, he also did quite a lot of drawings and he was, you can see, a very good artist. Uh, this was one of the large windmills, uh, which were plenty around here. He also studied the plants and animals in the local area and with his brother Charles he uh, produced this book at the age of 20 uh, and this is a, a really a fabulous collection. The same year, well, he, he actually said in later life uh, that the process of actually collecting all these uh, specimens had been one of the greatest sort of experiences of his life, not the actual knowledge about the plants and animals, but the actual process of actually cataloging them. At the age of 20, he went up to St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, and this is a, a drawing at about that time. He doesn't look much different now, actually. Um, and within a few months, in the anatomy department, um, he found a patient in, in the muscles. There were a lot of calcified uh, little areas. Um, and this is a drawing uh, w which he did at that time, and it's in the Royal College of Surgeons of England. And you can just see some tiny little dots. And these have been recognised for many, many years, um, but no one had actually sort of thought much about them. But James, being an inquisitive chap, got out his um, magnifying glass and noticed that this was a cyst 
and in it there was a worm which he dissected out. Uh, and he was the first person to do this. And this was he only been a medical student for two or three years, uh, two or three months. He came top in all the subjects each year, and after two years, he qualified um, as a young doctor. And in his final exam, Sir Astley Cooper, and uh, this is a statue of him in St Paul's Cathedral, um, who was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, um, examined him. Um, and uh, he also had actually grown up in Great Yarmouth, so he had two very famous surgeons uh, uh, developing in this town. The same year he qualified, he proposed to his sweetheart, but she had to wait eight years uh, before they got married because he had no money. Um, he was trying to pay off his father's debts with his uh, brother. Um, he earned some money by going to lectures. Uh, he wouldn't take any notes, but he would then uh, write about the, um, the talk that he'd, be, he'd been listening to um, in various magazines and journals. He was then appointed the curator at St. Bartholomew's Hospital's Museum and spent many years studying all these specimens and cataloguing them, um, and there were two and a half thousand specimens. Uh, he became very famous in the hospital uh, for his teaching, and he used to start off the, in the post-mortem room and then in the lecture theatres, and this is a, uh, an illustration of him uh, talking to the medical students, and you can see that they're all men, because he didn't have female medical students then. Uh, this is an illustration of the museum at the uh, College of Surgeons, and by this time he was cataloguing all the specimens there. In 1847 he was elected an assistant surgeon at St Bartholomew's Hospital, and it's very fortunate because that the same year they introduced um, anaesthesia. Because prior to that, this is how you carried out operations. Um, you can see the expression on the poor patient's face being sat upon by uh, a surgical assistant, two of them holding a chap's legs, and then you've got the surgeon here about to tackle uh, the patient. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society um, and he was the youngest person um, appointed that year and he had more votes than all the others put together. Uh, he became an examiner for the East India Company and he and his two other examiners were appalled by the lack of knowledge of the people um, applying to become surgeons for the East India Company that he refused to pass them. As a result, the um, standards were raised in the medical schools and the colleges, um, and the whole of medicine improved greatly as a result. Here, here's an illustration of what he looked like, a very handsome young man about that time. He was appointed surgeon to Queen Victoria, a post he held for many, many years. Um, he became a full surgeon at St Bartholomew's Hospital, and it wasn't until 1862 that he paid the final instalment of his father's debts, and he paid them with interest. He, he was dissecting in 1871 and uh, got a cut on his hand, and as a result, developed septicemia and nearly died. Uh, and as a result, he decided to resign his post as surgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And the same year, Millet, who was the, the artist at that time produced this portrait which is in St Bartholomew's Hospital and a copy of that is in the entrance hall to this hospital. He wrote about uh, disease of the breast and you can see how the uh, lining over the nipple has disappeared and he said that I've come across about 15 patients uh, where this has happened and in all of them within two years they developed a cancer of the breast. You all know this disease, uh, Paget's disease of bone, and you can see how the bone is distorted. This is this chap's hat, and here it is again several years later, showing how much larger his head had become. But not only did he describe those two diseases and the worm which I mentioned when he was a medical student, he, developed, he described, and he was the first to describe, all these conditions. 
carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm sure some of you have had an operation for that. I see someone waving their hand around. Um, but he was the first to describe all these. It just shows his great powers of observation. He became president of the Royal College of Surgeons, president of the Royal Medical and Surgical Society, which became the Royal, um, uh, Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, he was a member of the General Medical Council, which was set up a few years before to uh, oversee how doctors performed. And he became Vice-Chancellor of London University, which was a great triumph because he'd never been to university himself. This is a bust, uh, which is in the College of Surgeons. And this is a, a replica, you can see in front of you, of that bust. In 1888, he opened the new hospital in uh, Great Yarmouth. Um, the photograph above was taken on the day it was opened. And this is one I took in uh, 1981, shortly before it closed. It hadn't changed a great deal on the outside, not much inside either. But he had also had great influence in other matters. Um, he was chair of the pastor committee looking into the benefits of uh, treating patients with uh, rabies. Um, he influenced the way that smallpox was, uh, uh, people were vaccinated against smallpox. He was a protagonist for women uh, taking up medicine. And he stressed the importance of treating patients gently. And he devised an inf waterbed to try and prevent bed sores. The last few years of his life he was very weak and he died and was buried alongside his wife in Finchley Cemetery. So if I just briefly go through some of his attributes. He was a great observer and this he picked up from his mother and uh, he was a pathologist and a physiologist. Pathologist looking at the diseases of tissues. Physiologist is a person who actually um, looks at how the tissues and bodies work. Um, and he had a big advantage of having gone to, to become the curator at uh, the museum in St. Bartholomew's Hospital. He had an advantage over all the people who became surgeons because you had to be rather rich to become a surgeon. And you had to pay £500 to follow a surgeon around. And they didn't learn all the basics of pathology, physiology and, and anatomy, which he did. He became a great researcher. He was a wonderful teacher and a great orator. He would speak without notes in his slightly broad Norfolk accent. He was a great writer. He wrote 200 books and uh, papers. A wonderful clinician. I don't know how good a surgeon he was, but there wasn't much surgery done in those days. He was extremely religious. He wouldn't do anything apart from going to see his patients on Sundays. He showed enormous compassion. Um, and with all this, he remained extremely humble. He was probably um, the typical um, person who just uh, enjoys his work. And this is sort of really summarised in his motto that work itself is a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. The Padgett Association is very fortunate in having had descendants of Sir James Padgett serve as patrons of the charity. Sir Julian Padgett, Sir James' great-grandson, was a patron until his death in 2016. Sir James' great-great-grandson, Sir Henry Padgett, remains a patron of the association as, and is in the audience today. He spoke at our Exclamation Day in Newcastle last September, and I'd like to show a short video we recorded there. My name is uh, Sir Henry Padgett, and I am the great-great-grandson of Sir James Padgett, who discovered Padgett's disease. It has been estimated that less than 10% of those who have Padgett's disease actually come to medical attention. We know that a lot of people surrounding patients can have very little understanding of the condition. Because a lot of people do suffer from it and are not actually diagnosed with it. So the Padgett's awareness day is on the 11th of January 2019 and it is also the 205th anniversary of the birth of Sir James Padgett. We need people to get involved. One way to mark the day is to wear blue and green, the colours of the Padgett Association. 
the Bankers Association is, is promoting a, a new clinical guideline that has been developed to provide recommendations for the diagnosis and management of Patrick's disease. Well, I believe that the new clinical guideline will help doctors understand it better. The patient passport is something new that we've developed. It would be helpful for patients to have a passport that they could keep at home that basically gives them all the information about the treatment and creates better communication between the different specialities. We've got a lot of information about the awareness day on our website, paget.org.uk. If you want to contact us, please do on the next speaker this afternoon is Professor Mike Stone from the University Hospital at Flandon in Wales, who also serves as a trustee of the Padgett's Association. He will speak about Padgett's disease of bone and the recently completed guideline on the diagnosis and management of the condition. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. So I, I was feeling quite confident about giving this talk and until I sat through that fabulous uh, talk from Hugh about all the achievements of Sir James Padgett. I'm now feeling really quite inadequate. And the, the other thing was, of course, the public humiliation of Diana showing that video of me attempting to exercise to music uh, just before the meeting started. But anyway, moving on, I'm going to talk about Padgett's disease of bone, but with a focus on our new uh, clinical guidelines. So, by way of introduction, as you've heard, Paget's disease is common. It affects 1% to 2% of those older than 55 years. The risk increases a lot with age, so it pretty much doubles with every uh, decade uh, above the age of 55. Again, to re-emphasise, it's underdiagnosed and undertreated, but we do have a very effective treatment in the form of bisphosphonates as I will demonstrate uh, in a moment. As you know, it can either affect one bone, and we call that monostotic, or it can affect multiple bones, and we would call that polyostotic. So what exactly uh, is it? Well, it's an abnormality of the normal bone renewal process. So everybody renews their whole skeleton every five to ten years or so, and, and by a process called uh, bone remodelling. And that process of bone renewal uh, is abnormal if you have Paget's disease, and it's disorganised and excessive. And that disrupts the quality of the bone, it changes the x-ray appearance, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, and it also leads to this abnormal blood test, which is the blood uh, level of alkaline phosphatase. And that, that becomes high, often in the context of Paget's disease. In terms of cause and risk factors, um, as we've already heard in the video, perhaps we don't know the exact cause, but we do know that, as one might expect, genetics certainly have an important role to play. And there are lots of genes that are involved, but the most important one is the one I've showed you here, which is called sequestrosome 1, the sequestrosome 1 uh, mutation. So if Paget runs in a family and several members of the family have it, um, it's quite a common mutation to find. And then together with this genetic mutation, it looks as if you need some sort of environmental trigger which then leads to clinical Paget's disease. And again, we don't know for sure exactly what that is, but there are some front runners, and perhaps the two front runners I've listed here, and that includes what we call a slow virus infection, so things like measles virus have been implicated, or some sort of toxin uh, in the environment. What we do know from studies looking at the uh, the uh, epidemiology of Paget's disease is that the incidence of Paget's is decreasing dec decade by decade. And we think probably that's 
related to a decrease in some environmental trigger. So what are the clinical features of Paget's disease of bone? Well, I've underlined it here, and I think the most important and, and the one symptom that we can address best with treatment is bone pain. So it can cause bone pain, and that's readily amenable to treatment, as we'll see when we look at the guidelines. It can uh, cause a deformity of the bone, particularly if it's weight-bearing. It can also lead to early osteoarthritis, or wear and tear arthritis, if you like, in the joint that's next to a bone affected by Paget's, particularly if it's a misshapen bone. If the bone enlarges, and that can happen, it can compress nerves, the bone can break, can break spontaneously without any trauma, and we would call that a pathological fracture. And a very serious but extremely rare uh, complication of Paget's disease is uh, a malignancy called osteosarcoma, but, but I'll emphasise that that's very rare. Paget's disease of bone, it can affect any bone in the skeleton, but the most common ones I've listed here. So that's the pelvis, the femur or thigh bone, the tibia or shin bone, the spine and the skull. Those are the most commonly uh, affected bones that we see. Here's an x-ray picture of a patient of mine, and this is his shin bone. He's been coming to my clinic for about 25 years now, um, and that's normal bone on the right. So this is tibia or shin bone. If you compare this Paget's disease bone here with the normal bone on the right, you can see there's an obvious difference. The texture, the quality of that bone is clearly abnormal. You've got areas of bone thickening. You've also got areas of bone loss all mixed up happening together. And this is this disorganization of the bone renewal property. The bone has become enlarged, it's become thickened, and it's become deformed, it's become bowed. And here, shown indicated by the red arrow, you can see a partial fracture or stress fracture in the surface of that bone. So one of these pathological fractures, if you like, which is trying to heal, but it, it, it really can't, unless, unless you put it in a splint or you, you go and see the surgeon and have something done about it, those fractures very uh, rarely heal. So an example of the x-ray appearance of uh, Paget's disease. We would often do um, an isotope bone scan, a special type of bone scan, which will indicate where the Paget's is in the skeleton and whether it's active. And where it's indicated black here, that's high uptake of the injected solution which is radioactively labelled and you can see highly active Paget's disease in this patient's uh, tibia or shin bone. And then after a single dose of the treatment, that's intravenous zoledronic acid, you've gone from that to that. So a very effective response in terms of metabolic activity and indeed in clinical response uh, in this patient with resolution of the pain uh, in his tibia. And we'd, we'd spent many years giving him lots of other different treatments, uh, other types of bisphosphonate, and he'd never responded very well. And then one dose of intravenous zoledronic acid, and it pretty much uh, cured him, certainly in, in terms of his uh, pain response. The main focus now is going to be on our new guidelines. Um, we did produce some guidelines many years ago, published in 2002, and myself and our chairman uh, and Peter Selby in Manchester uh, were, together with Mike Davey, were co-authors of these uh, guidelines. Um, and we always meant to update them, but kind of never really got round to doing it. And for the past uh, several years, uh, we've been talking about it. Stephen Tuck, who's um, our co-chair of the Padgett's Association, um, has really driven uh, this process forward and has chaired the group. And we finally did uh, set up what we called the Guideline Development Group to go about updating our Padgett's Disease Guidelines. So that was established back in January 2016. Uh, it was commissioned by the Padgett's Association 
uh, but also with the collaboration and contributions from the European Calcified Tissue Society and the International Osteoporosis Foundation, to, so to make it pan-European and indeed uh, global. The group um, comprised people from lots of different disciplines, and that's important. So lots of different hospital specialists who might be involved in uh, dealing with patients with Paget's disease. So care of the elderly specialists, joint specialists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, biochemists, non-clinical scientists, our specialist nurse Diana, and a patient, very important to have a patient on the group. Keith Simpson was our patient representative, and he's going to be uh, speaking to you next. And we, and we had quite a few people who made up uh, this panel from lots of uh, different countries. Um, if you're going about producing um, guidelines, uh, these days you have to use a certain uh, methodology in order for them to be received well and have authority. Um, so we set about this in an internationally agreed evidence-based uh, way. So first of all, we use this thing called the grade tool, so whereby you grade the quality of your evidence and recommendations, and that's important for credibility. So that's internationally accepted and used by uh, a lot of organisations. We then got a professional organ organisation to perform a comprehensive review of the literature. So that's obviously crucial. And then you can uh, rank the quality of that evidence uh, in this manner. So at the top, you have what's called a systematic review of more than one randomised controlled trial. Next best would be a single randomised controlled trial. That's the best way to get good quality evidence, is to randomly allocate uh, a patient to a treatment. Um, then you've just got what we call observational trials, where you just observe what happens, but not in a randomised manner. And then lastly, the lowest quality of uh, evidence would be just looking at a series of patients and looking for patterns, patterns and just seeing what happened. And we only looked at case series where it involved at least uh, 10 uh, patients. And then we set ourselves six key questions to address, to answer. So question one is, which measurements or tools are effective in the identification and diagnosis of Paget's disease? Question two is, which measurements or tools may be effective in predicting the response to treatment? And I'll address that now, there aren't really any. I mean, nothing's really terribly good at predicting the response to treatment. Question three uh, is the what are the indications for drug treatment in Paget's disease? Question four is what are the effects of drug treatment? Five is for those prescribed drugs, pharmacological interventions, what's the optimal duration or mode or type of treatment? And then question six was what are the effects of non-drug treatment uh, in Paget's disease. And we spent a lot of time uh, looking at all the papers, all the evidence relevant to these questions. We were subdivided into groups. We kind of locked ourselves in a room for a couple of days uh, and went about doing all of this. The other thing I should say is that our, uh, our chair, who's going to succeed, uh, uh, Roger Francis, Stuart Ralston, was very much uh, the person who did a lot of the work in actually putting these guidelines together and, and actually uh, writing them. And then in terms of coming to recommendations, and, and obviously that's really important, when people look at these guidelines, I think it's fair to say a lot of people will kind of go straight to the recommendations. But you've got to go through these steps before you get to a recommendation. You've obviously got to look at the risks versus the benefits and, and the balance between those. You have to look at the quality of the evidence, and I've already uh, talked about that. You need to consider the patient's values and preferences, and we'll hear from Keith about that in a moment. And you can't avoid it. You've got to look at cost, health economics, and the use of resources. And then at the end of that process, you can make 
uh, recommendations. And we'll look at some of those. Obviously, I can't go through all of them. I think we made 26 recommendations, so I'll just go th through some of the key recommendations. In terms of diagnosis, um, we've stuck with this concept that measuring the alkaline phosphatase in the blood, the total alkaline phosphatase, which is a readily available um, test, which is quite cheap, that's recommended as a first-line biochemical screening test, and someone you suspect may have padgets. So it, it might be high if you have active padgets. Some people have active padgets, particularly if it's a small bone or it's just one bone, they might have a total alkaline phosphatase within the reference range, within the normal range, but the Paget disease is still active. And under those circumstances, we, we have recommended that it's reasonable to then consider more sensitive tests, such as bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, which is BALP, or P1MP, which is another uh, blood test, which is a bit more sensitive at picking up active Paget's disease through uh, a blood test. In terms of uh, diagnosis, um, I've already shown you that picture of an isotope bone scan, and we're still recommending that patients have isotope bone scans, together with what we call targeted x-rays. Um, again, I haven't got time to go into this in a lot of detail. We had a lot of discussion talking about the relative merits of a batch of screening x-rays, if you like, and we have a big study from Spain supporting that approach, so that if you x-ray the skull, the abdomen, pelvis, and the shin bones, if you kind of do all of those, uh, sorry, sorry, and the femur bones, then that may be nearly as good as an isotope bone scan. But in the end, we thought a combination of the two was the best broad recommendation. So an isotope bone scan, together with targeted x-rays, are the best way of demonstrating a patient has Paget's disease and defining the extent and metabolic activity of that uh, Paget's disease. Don't, don't get too worried where it says quality of evidence very low. That's because we can't have randomised trials when we're looking at these uh, diagnostic tests, which is why that's ranked low. It just means we don't have randomised trials as such, uh, which, which are more relevant to interventions with treatment. In terms of drug treatments, well, this, this type of treatment called bisphosphonates, which you've all heard about, are, are clearly uh, the best treatments that we recommend for use uh, in Paget's disease of bone, particularly with respect to relieving bone pain. So that's where the evidence is best. So we got several randomised controlled trials, so the quality of our evidence is now so-called moderate, um, whereby we can show clearly that bisphosphonates reduce bone pain, which is being caused by Paget's disease of bone. And more than that, we can now go a step further. So this is one of the new recommendations, is that we would specifically say that intravenous zoledronic acid is the best treatment. So there have been some head-to-head -head studies, um, and both in terms of the response in, in terms of the blood test going down and perhaps more importantly in terms of the clinical response with respect to pain relief, then intravenous zoledronic acid is the best treatment. So if you can have it and you can get it and there's no safety concern about receiving it, then we now recommend that that is uh, the treatment of choice. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of areas where we don't have enough evidence to make recommendations. And there was quite a lot of that as you go through the document, that we have insufficient evidence, um, particularly maybe with respect to the complications of Paget's disease. So things like arthritis, uh, those pathological fractures, blood loss from orthopaedic surgery, the malignancy, and even quality of life. Um, we really have insufficient evidence to make clear recommendations and we made some recommendations for research to try uh, and clarify this. Um, another recommendation, again this is new, this is off the back of the PRISM trial um, 
And this is that we're now saying that you should really focus on relieving bone pain rather than getting the blood test down into the normal range. Um, again, we had a lot of discussion around this, um, but that is the recommendation, that you shouldn't be maybe obsessively focusing on getting the blood test to normal, but focus on the patient's uh, symptoms. I can see Diana's looking at her watch, so presumably I need to hurry up and finish. I think I've only got a couple more slides. The other new recommendation is that I think there's been hesitation in permitting patients to get surgery uh, for osteoarthritis related to Paget's disease. But actually the outcomes look generally good. So we felt able to make a recommendation that things like hip and knee replacement surgery is something that we do recommend for patients who don't respond to medical therapy who have osteoarthritis related to Paget's disease. And my last slide, Diana, is that uh, we've now uh, submitted the guideline paper to the most uh, prestigious bone journal, that's the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, and that has been accepted for publication. It's in press and will be published probably within uh, the next month. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mike. We're now going to hear about the patient's perspective of patches at bone from Mr. Keith Simpson who is a trustee of the charity and who also contributed to the development of the guideline. Thank you, Roger. Uh, yes, well, I was diagnosed with Paget's disease of the bone about 11 years ago now. It was uh, following on from, I used to play a lot of golf. I love me golf. <laughs> but of course, every time when I came in after a round of golf, I was suffering. I was in pain in my knees in my legs. Uh, mobility was getting bad. Yeah, uh, my golf started to struggle. Probably in the captain's year I was very busy, but that didn't help. Um, but yes, I, I finished up at the hospital. X-ray indicated I'd got two bad hips. My knees were fine. Two bad hips and possible Paget's disease. Uh, I had further tests, blood tests bone scan, and uh, yes, I've got Paget's disease in the right femur, Paget's disease of the bone in my right femur. At the time, the surgeon, uh, no, well, not a surgeon, the consultant uh, said he would not treat me. Um, yes, when, you, when you're told you've got a bone disease, it was quite a shock. Um, you know, nobody knew about it. Nobody, everybody I spoke to, no, didn't know anything about it. I went on the web, and yes, thankfully, Padgett's Association was there, and it was nice. There was lots of information, so it was, it was a relief to see that. But it was two years later that, with a lot of pain, I was back again at the hospital, uh, down to the x-ray, shown some pictures. I'd got a fractured femur. Um, it, it wasn't good. <laughs> uh, I was kept in hospital. Uh, I had a surgical repair. I had a 12 inch plate and eight large screws. Uh, I was also told that probably I would uh, be put on the list for a new hip, a new left hip, my right hip. Um, there's our fracture. Um, the right hip didn't want to know. Uh, again, that reluctance to uh, sort of go into a Paget area. Of course, um, the, third, the, the consultant I'd seen before my, the fracture was revealed, um, he'd only seen three patients with Pagets in the previous three years. It was then I spoke to the Pagets Association, the Pagets Association nurse at the time, and uh, looking for really a, a, a centre that was uh, experienced in the treatment of Paget's and I finished up going to, I, I got a referral to Nottingham. In fact, now it's a, a Paget's um, Association Centre of Excellence, which, which is great. Um, but then they, they, did, they did, again, further blood tests, x-rays, and uh, yes, I was given the old clear for a, a new left hip, and um, I'm showing the repair there, 
But then I got a new left hip. So the metal work's starting to build up now. I've got quite a bit. Um, it, uh, it worked quite well, but I was six months on crutches, no weight on that leg, uh, quite a bit of muscle loss. Um, again, I got the problem that my left hip, to make sure that I was clear of Paget's, I had the test, and yes, I was given the okay. You know, that, so that, it, it went well. But it took, took something like two years to heal. Um, I was monitored with regards to the Pagets. I had um, residinate tablets. I had zolidronate, <laughs> um, an infusion of zolidronate. It was at that time, actually, and uh, I was at one of the AGM and information days, actually here in Norwich, um, and speaking to a retired orthopedic surgeon who is not too far away from me now, Hugh, and he was uh, to saying that, uh, yes, he wouldn't have tattled my, uh, my right hip. But he did know of a fellow surgeon that possibly, he did difficult problems, and uh, he may be interested. And in fact, the gentleman, the, the surgeon was, um, eminent surgeon was based in Nottingham and that's where I went for my treatment so that was great I was able to get a referral um, the surgeon saw me he felt that um, it was a, a yes he could do the job basically he was going to leave that plate in place and take the large screws out and put short screws in and that being successful he would continue on with the operation and give me a new hip of course, this was again subject to the Pagets being at a low, you know, low blood flow. Um, uh, yes, that was again further tests to confirm that. But I think there's a lidronate that helps slow things down. So I had the operation, and uh, and there we go. Um, a, a new hip. So I got two new hips. It was fantastic. I mean, all that time. I'd been in pain because, of course, I, we didn't know whether it was the Pagets or whether it was the hip. Um, I was on paracetamol, tramadol, buprenorphine patches, but suddenly I'd come through that. It was a 10-year period, but I'd come through it. Just keep asking and keep asking. <laughs> and, um, and with the support of the Pagets Association, I'd got a good doctor. You know, she'd only seen one Pagets patient, but she was able to refer me each time. And of course, finally, I'm the surgeon that was willing to, to tackle the difficult problems. Um, yeah, I'm back, to, I'm back to playing golf now, which is fantastic. <laughs> and so, uh, I thank you for listening to me, thank you. Thanks very much, Keith. As you just heard, the Patches Association provides much needed advice and support <coughs> patients with Patches disease and their families and carers. Much of this is provided by Diana Wilkinson, our specialist Patches nurse, who will now talk about the work of the association. So I'm Diana, I'm the nurse for the charity. Um, the charity was founded in uh, 1973 by a lady called Anne Stansfield because her husband had Paget's disease and we are the only UK charity to focus solely on Paget's disease of bone. This is a snapshot of who we are today, and we're here to make sure that anybody that's affected by Paget's disease, including professionals who care for people with the condition, that they have somewhere to go to for support. So on this, the first ever International Paget's Awareness Day, we're here to let people know that the Paget's Association actually means business. And I want to ask some questions today. What if? What if we could find every single one of those people out there who are suffering and remain undiagnosed and get them to a specialist? What if nobody had to be in pain for years while struggling to obtain a diagnosis? I hear this so many times when people call the helpline. My blood results haven't been quite right for a few years, um, but it takes them 10 years to actually get a diagnosis. And what if we could actually prevent Paget's disease from occurring in the first place? And even what if there was a cure? So these are all things that we are trying to address. 
And until we get to the bottom of these, then the Paget's Association will be here to help. To apologise in advance, Professor Stone, for the next slide. But if we achieve all these things, we're going to have a party. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it's a pretty strange party, but we're going to have a party. Um, because there won't be any need for our charity anymore. But until that time, these are some of the things that we are doing to support people. So you've heard about the new guidelines, so I'm not going to dwell on that. It will be made available publicly. Everybody will be able to access that. On the back of that, we have revised our own information. So we have a fax booklet. And as soon as the guideline is officially published, then the fax book booklet will also be published in the updated form as well. We have information events throughout the year. Details of all these things are on our website. And the next big event that we're currently planning is in October. And you've heard about Nottingham already. We're going to be going to Nottingham in October for a whole Paget's Information Day. We also have a, a newsletter. So that comes out to members four times a year. And if you ask anybody who gets it, they'll tell you that there's no advertising in there. It's stuffed full of information. If you want to become a member in the UK, we charge £15 a year and overseas £20. Details, as I say, for all these things are on our website. In the last newsletter, we did actually send out the Paget's passport. This was developed in conjunction with the Centre of Excellence in Southampton. And I thank Dr Curtis for suggesting that they would like to have this and we made it available to everyone. So this is something that is available to all uh, members of the association to fill in their own personal details and help improve communications between specialists and help raise awareness as well. So on the subject of the Centre of Excellence Award, we do have 12 centres of excellence currently up and down the UK. We hope there will be more in the future, but currently there's 12. And today, the award is being presented to the team at Manchester Royal Infirmary. So a massive shout out to um, Professor Peter Selby and his team, who are hopefully watching. Very well done and congratulations. Um, the award is being presented today by um, Vice Chairman um, Dr Stephen Tuck. So yeah, somebody was going to clap then. Let's give a clap to Manchester Royal Infirmary. OK, so we're also funding research. So these are three of the grants that we funded last year. So I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that we're looking at mechanisms of pain in Paget's disease, also the, ge the genetics of Paget's disease, and also um, we're funding a project in Runcorn in Cheshire to do with medieval Paget's disease and what we can actually learn from that today. In addition, we do have student bursaries, and Professor Francis is going to mention that later. <laughs> Very new and hot off the press are vacation scholarships. This is a summer vacation research scholarship for undergraduates, students who are interested in looking at Paget's disease. So funds will be provided to help them, um, and it can be science, medical students, nurses, allied health professionals. The details will be on our website in the next couple of weeks. If you want to hear more talks by the experts, then we do have uh, DVDs available. We had a big meeting in September, and we do have DVDs available from that. They are in the office now. You can ring us. Um, they will be in our online shop, hopefully by the end of next week. There are some of the talks available on YouTube. Not all of them, but some of them on YouTube. If you look for the Padgett's Association channel on YouTube, some are on there. So. I am the nurse for the helpline. Um, I offer support, advice, information to anybody who needs it, including health professionals. We also have a support network, and that is for any members of the charity who would like to talk to other people who have Paget's disease. There is also an online forum, and that's accessed either by going to the Health Unlocked website or via our own website as well. So we're doing all these things to help people who are affected by Paget's disease. The webinar is a first for us today, so if you're hearing me clearly, it's working and we can breathe a, a huge sigh of relief. Um, it's also our first Paget's Awareness Day, and we decided to go big from the start and make it international. Um, so I hope you're all taking part today. We do need you to help us. 
Um, remember Sid, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are like Sid. He's one of the worst cases of Paget's disease we've seen. He's got a bowed leg, he's had fractures, he's deaf because he's got it in his skull. And if we can support Sid, then we can support an awful lot of people. So remember Sid, the S is for Support the Awareness Day every year. The I is for Inform Someone About Paget's Disease. So many people say they just don't understand it, they don't know what it is. And D is Do Something, Please, to help our charity spread the word and raise awareness. So we know people have been doing that today. I've had photographs coming in um, today of people wearing blue and green on Paget's Day, so thank you for that. Um, shout out to Nottingham already for getting their photographs in. And people have also been knitting in the association's colours, blue and green. There is a photograph competition on our website, still open for entries if you would like to enter. Um, again, all the information is on our website. And if you want to join the conversation on social media, we're on all the usual sites, including Twitter and Facebook. So post your photos. You can also send them to us at the office for the newsletter. And I really do believe that together, we can actually make an absolute difference to everybody who's affected by Paget's disease. Those are our contact details, so please, please do get in touch. Thanks, Diana. Diana's done a fantastic job for us over the years that she's worked for us, and I think we all value your contribution. The Association has funded a number of research grants and student research bursaries over the years. One of the recipients was Dr. Darrell Green from the University of East Anglia in Norwich. And he studied um, osteosarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer, which is a very rare complication of Paget's disease. He was due to give a short presentation on his work today, but at, um, at short notice, he had to go and see a very sick patient with osteosarcoma. So he sent his apologies. In the time remaining this afternoon, the speakers will address questions from the local audience and also those received by text or email. If we don't get time for your question or it is about your own personal experience, you can always contact the association through the helpline or email where our specialist Paget's nurse Diana, backed up by our clinical and scientific trustees, will try to answer them. So I can invite the speakers up to the uh, table here and we will hopefully take some questions which I think Diana will read to us that we've received both from the local audience and remotely from elsewhere in the world. Okay, so this is from Janet. Is there a simple test available to the offspring of Paget's disease sufferers to determine if they have Paget's disease or if they are likely to develop the disease in later life? I'm gonna hand that over to Mike Stone. So, if you have um, a relative and you're worried that they might have Paget's disease, um, you can, I mean, you can measure their alkaline phosphatase uh, to see if that's, if that's raised. Um, there is actually uh, a study looking at this very subject and looking at people who have this genetic mutation, the um, sequester M1 mutation, and it's following them up over a long period of time. And, and it will look to see if that sort of approach uh, is helpful. So a part of you based on clinical suspicion, um, you can do a simple blood test and, and then you obviously take it further depending uh, on what you find. Um, does that sound reasonable, Roger? That sounds fine. I mean, what is the prospect of genetic testing, Mike, um, in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, there's the prospect of genetic testing for absolutely everything, and I think that may well come to fruition in Paget's disease of bone as well. And, I mean, as you know, with Stuart Ralston's study, we, we may get some answers along those lines. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Um, Diana, have we got another question? This is from Barry in Australia. Could the specialist comment on the demographics of Paget's disease and the potential reasons it seems more common in people of British descent? I'm making Mike work hard today. <laughs> Mike, over to you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's back to genetics again first. It's, it's genetics and environmental triggers interacting. 
So the, the thinking is that there was a genetic mutation which was um, in Europe, perhaps in the UK, and, and there's evidence that as people um, migrate away from that centre, they take their risks with them, strongly implying uh, that the genetics are important. But then you also need a, a, an environmental trigger and, and the, again, there are all sorts of possible candidates for this, um, and, and, and it's a combination of the two. Thanks very much, Mike. Have we got a, another question, Diana? Uh, also from Australia, would the Padgett's Association or the James Padgett Hospital consider establishing a museum of Padgett's history? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Certainly the association currently does not have uh, a museum as such. We have provided uh, in the past a short summary of the life of Sir James Paget, which drew heavily on Hugh Sturzaker's book. Um, in terms of the James Paget Hospital, Hugh, would you like to talk about um, what we have here? Yes, we have. We have some books um, and uh, some illustrations of Paget in the library, which is named the James Paget Library. Um, I don't know whether, we, I think it's a discussion we should have with actually the librarian who is a great authority on Paget, but also a great collector. Okay, thanks very much. It's also worth mentioning that the library houses the, the bust of Sir James Paget, which is shown there on the plinth. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And I understand that when the Trust Board meets here at the James Paget University Hospital, they always put that on the table, which is, I, I think, a wonderful way of remembering Sir James Paget. I, I wish the association had got a bus that we'd put in our, mm. <laughs> on our boardroom for meetings. Possibly could be arranged. <laughs> a next one, Diana? Have the specialists discovered signs of Pagets in the autopsy records and exhibits from ancient, medieval, or Victoria era, era burial sites? Yeah, it's interesting the Patchett's Association has funded research um, it, of the uh, medieval um, skeletons in uh, w Warrington, uh, in Runcorn. Um, I don't know, Mike, do you know anything that you can say about that particularly? I think the short answer to that is no, because I haven't been directly uh, involved in that. But, but certainly look at those, um, the medieval burial sites, the there was a spectacular severity of Padgett's, which was quite striking. I mean, we, we've already mentioned that perhaps the incidence of Padgett's has been decreasing, perhaps related to the removal of some of these environmental triggers. What we, we didn't talk about was the severity of the disease, but it was extraordinarily severe in, in, some, of those, uh, in some of those skeletons from, from the burial sites. Um, and I think that's been a consistent thing. I mean, obviously, that research is underway. I mean, unfortunately, Professor Bill Fraser is not here, and he's been involved much more closely with it. Um, and I'm sure we'll be seeing lots of really interesting new data coming from that, including genetics, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think you should say it's not only the severity, it's the fact that so many of the skeletons had got involvement with Paget's yeah, disease. Um, and I, I am aware that the genetics work is, undergo is underway, and certainly Daryl Green fr from Norwich has been looking at some of his work in terms of RNA expression in some of those bones. I haven't seen any results at the moment uh, because I'm not directly involved with that. Sure. But it is good to see that the association is funding that research. Diana, have we got a, another Final question? Final question, Professor Francis. Will the new guideline be made available to the public, and if so, when? Right. Well, basically, the guideline is due to be published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research probably in late, Jan uh, late February. Um, and as part of that, we have paid um, a substantial amount of money for it to be made what we call open access, which means that anyone can actually access the paper for free. Now, that's not always the case with scientific literature. So it means that anyone, be they a healthcare professional, a patient, or just someone interested, will be able to download the publication and look at, uh, look at it. Um, and as soon as it's published, it will be available online on an open access basis, which is great news. Also, um, Diana will, and, and indeed the colleagues, will be producing um, shortened versions which we will distribute. Um, it's perhaps also worth mentioning that we have produced some what's called infographics, which is really a two-page um, illustrated document about how you actually um, diagnose and treat Patches disease. So hopefully that will prove useful. 
someone from America has just sent us a question. Would you like me to? Okay, I'll I'll read it if you like. Literally, say... just come in. Okay. <laughs> This is great, up to the minute. Does the association or the UK medical community communicate with US to any degree? We have no associ association here and the medical community isn't fairly, is fairly, isn't, is fairly ignorant about Paget's disease. My GP accidentally found my Paget's on an X-ray after my alkaline phosphatase was elevated. Um, he wrote it off to the fact that I'm after the menopause and didn't check the Paget's disease. Um, right, well, certainly there was an association in the past for Paget's disease in the US, and indeed it was at one stage very successful and even had an office on Wall Street. Um, offices in Wall Street don't come cheap, and that may be one of the reasons why the organisation <laughs> folded. We have much more modest um, offices in Swinton, Manchester. But to answer the question, uh, we are trying to develop links internationally, uh, not only in the US, but around the world. And that, of course, is one of the reasons why we're hosting the webinar today, to really bring the message across. And certainly, organizations such as the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, um, the, the um, European Calcified Tissue Society, are all helping to promote the international basis of this. And I know now we're reaching the end of our webinar, and perhaps I should just highlight what this um, person from the US said about our contribution. Bless us for the work that you do, which I think is very nice. So finally, really, it's my job to thank the speakers, the trustees of the charity, and the staff of the Pagets Association, together with the James Paget University Hospital, TVV from Newcastle, who have run the webinar, and of course our audience, both here in the Great Yarmouth and beyond, for their interest in Paget's disease. We hope that this Awareness Day will become an annual event on the 11th of January uh, in subsequent years. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>